Um, but oh, um, just gonna keep it a wee bit informal, a wee bit chatty, and just to provide that little bit of context. Um, if you know, like myself before, um, I started working for the company, and as Elizabeth was just saying, I think it's not anything you would generally have interaction with at kind of um, library assistant level, or if you're at the very beginning of your career or um, a library assistant. So um, I'll just get to sharing my screen now, and get onto my slides. There we go now. So first of all, just to provide a bit of introduction to ourselves. So um, there's myself, uh, I'm a sales and marketing consultant with PTFS Europe. And then Fiona Borthwick joining us tonight, who's gonna to be taking over for me in a wee bit to give quite a comprehensive bit of background on her career. And um, she's head of sales and account management. And um, so we're both on the sales team. Here we are in the sales team on a trip we took to London to visit some of our accounts, some of our customers. And um, we just so happened to be outside the Royal Albert Hall here. Um, but we did shamelessly like tag them in our Twitter posts of this picture and kind of um, made it seem like we had attended the proms, which coincidentally were happening that evening. But um, unfortunately, that's about as close as we got. Um, but that's Fiona and myself there in the middle, and we're joined by um, Andrew and Jonathan. Um, so I know, as I was saying, Fiona's going to give a bit more of a detailed background of her career. And um, obviously, there's much more of a kind of path there. But just from my um, perspective, um, I came to PTFS Europe um, in August time, having previously worked as a library assistant in the cataloging department at Queen's University in Belfast. And before that, I'd worked in the library of an international school in Bangkok. And then uh, before that, I'd started off as a graduate trainee at Bradford University. So I very much kind of came from mostly kind of the academic library world. Um, so it's been quite um, a learning curve then and has really called on quite a different skill set um, looking for that kind of sales and marketing kind of background. But um, as I'll kind of talk about in um, my second talk a wee bit later in the evening, um, the skills are kind of broadly applicable, I think more and more. So there's every reason if you are looking to for your first professional post to cast net quite wide and to look into kind of um, organizations that you might not have considered originally. I mean, I came across this post because um, I knew I was moving away from Belfast and um, to Portsmouth where I'm now in the south of England. And um, so it basically was a result of searching for remote library jobs, which, as we all know, are becoming a lot more commonplace. And I'm so glad that I did. And I'm so glad I came across a job description that really fit a lot of aspects of what I liked about working in the library world into a kind of really different and dynamic role. But that's enough about me. Um, a wee bit more about the company. This is pretty much um, all of us here. Um, at a recent company meeting minus we've had uh, one person leave and one new start and we are um, growing at the minute which is a very exciting time but um, as we've kind of said from the get-go we are an open source uh, library solutions company so just right off the bat um, open source, if it's not something that you've come across before, is computer software that's released under a license that allows the copyright holder the rights to kind of um, grant users the ability to change, study and distribute that software and its source code to anyone for absolutely any purpose. And, and it's often developed in a collaborative public manner. So it's oftentimes just things that you can download the internet yourself and you don't have to pay for. Um, so we are the premier supplier of open source library solutions in the UK. 
And as we say, many of the products that we host and support are freely available online. So really what we are presenting to people, our whole value proposition is based on kind of really high touch customer service and really quality support are our key selling points. And um, it's the reason why so many people like working with us, we reckon, is that we solve problems rather than actually trying to sell software to them. And that's really what's at the heart of the open source movement that we're really committed to advancing in the library sector. We are a 100% virtual company in terms of the way we work. So we're all dotted across um, the UK. Fiona's in Fife there, whereas I'm down here with the bottom of the UK and um, uh, in Portsmouth and we are just really kind of scattered all through and um, so this is often how we work we look really contemplative here like we're in proper serious mode this is just a screenshot from last week we had an open discussion event that we held um, via zoom that allowed our customers to just kind of hop on zoom have a wee bit of chat with us on the topic of upgrades and um, just kept it a bit of an open forum where we can get a bit of feedback from them and tell them about upcoming developments. But I include this picture because this is how we meet every morning um, at half nine. We just hop on Zoom, outline what we're working on for the day and kind of tackle any kind of, of our weekly topics like software developments. We'll get in uh, on a Wednesday, talk about infrastructure one of the days, just to keep tabs on everything that's going on in the company. And um, so here's just a wee um, slide to show you the various products that we work with. And um, so COA is maybe the main one that you've heard of. That's probably, I'd say, what we're best known for in the sector. Um, but maybe at this stage, I think one of the ones that's best well known just from like a layman's perspective, certainly I would know like it's WordPress and having worked with WordPress, we also host and support that for our customers as another kind of open source um, web solution. And here is just an example of all the various sectors that we work with. So we work all across the library sector. And we've got government bodies there, the UK Parliament, House of the Erectors, and um, academic libraries and um, public libraries. It's really quite a broad um, broad scope that we take. And it just goes to show um, how well kind of COA, for example, fits across libraries of a range of kind of size and specialties. So I was talking just a wee bit about COA there. But to give you a wee bit more background, um, just because it is uh, really our kind of key product, and um, it outlines, you know, our commitment to open source software and the open source community, um, and that's born out of twelve years of working with the world's most successful open source library system, which is Coa. And the fact that it's open source is a unique selling point, but it's probably not the key reason why people are drawn to it. There's the openness of the development model and the ability to collaborate closely, which really aligns with the principles of most libraries and that libraries are collaborative and communicative by nature. They work hard to share with one another and they understand kind of freedom and its value. And that really fits generally with the open source remit. Uh, we're part of a worldwide community of over 40 COA service organizations. You're all continually collaborating and working on COA to develop it for over 15,000 customer systems worldwide. Wide. So I think it's really interesting for that perspective. It's something that's always kind of been continually enhanced all over the world. It makes it really exciting. And as I say, um, it is developed and financially supported in a real focused way by a network of over 40 COA partner service companies worldwide. So that's about 250 individuals contributing to the code, the research and the development capability underlying COA. So it's as big as and probably larger than most of the proprietary vendors that are operating in the library sector. And it is indeed one of the world's most used um, library management systems. So there's just a lot to be said for it. I mean, it's so different from proprietary systems in that you don't purchase those licenses. Our customers aren't really bound to us as a company. So that's why our support really is our number one priority. And it's something we're proud of. 
and that we're quite well known for. Um, it's something that we constantly get really positive feedback about and are really, really proud of. Um, and, you know, with that, as well as kind of our customers getting that kind of close personal relationship with us as a result of us focusing very intently on our support, they also have access to that worldwide community of highly engaged COA users that are part of that open source community. And, you know, with that, you also get a range of online and hopefully increasingly in-person events throughout the year. There was COACon there a couple of months ago um, that was a big event as well as our own. So that's just a little um, quick intro there. So um, I will hand over to Fiona, who'll give a bit more of a background to herself and how she ended up in the role that she's in today. Um, but thanks for listening. And I think there'll be time for if any questions crop up in the meantime, um, if you want to put them in the chat, I think there should be time at the end to go through them. But thank you for listening. Great, thanks Ailish. I'll just share my screen now. So hopefully you can see my screen. I'll just crawl. So um, just as Ailish said, go back a page. I am going to talk about um, where it all began for me in terms of, oh, wait a minute, I'll just go back. Sorry, one second. There we go. Slideshow. Right. So yeah, I'm going to talk about my library experience and how those skills I learned at library school and in the jobs I've had since graduating have got me to where I am just now and really just to show you as new professionals that there is a lot more you can do with your library degree than just working in a library. Um, so I'm going to take you through my experience from being a part-time library assistant many many years ago to the role that I'm in just now, which is the Head of Sales and Account Management at PTFS Europe. Okay, so where did it all begin? Well, when I was 15, um, I was very lucky enough to be offered a Saturday job in a public library. So as Ailish said, I'm in Fife, so it was one of the Fife libraries, but it was even before it was that long ago that it was even before Fife became Fife Council and it still had all its separate districts. So my position was in a very small branch with four hours on a Saturday morning in a branch that used a brown issue. So that's pretty much unheard of now, but every week I had that dread of please don't drop the tray, please don't drop the tray because I'd have to fix all the tickets in the issue tray. Um, so that's where it began. And then following that, I moved to 12 hours a week. So I did two week evenings, a Tuesday and a Thursday after school, worked the late nights. And then I still continued doing the Saturday morning in the branch and then afternoon in the central library. And it was great. I was there for years. I began at 15 and I was there until I finished school. Um, but I also worked extra hours during summer holidays, Christmas holidays, Easter holidays. So I, I was there a lot and I really did enjoy the job. And of course, I was still at school. So I was starting to think about where did I want my career to go? And I'll be honest, the, the whole thing of working in a library had never really occurred to me before. But I really enjoyed this little part time job. And, you know, I thought maybe this is something I want to pursue. So when it came time to um, start applying for university, that was really at the top of my list. So following school, I went to Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. And the course that I studied was Information and Library Studies. And again, many years ago, that that's, we still offered an entire undergraduate course in, in, in that. So I did it for four years. Um, but within that four years, it wasn't full info and lib studies. There was other elements to it as well. For example, I did an elective course in publishing. We also did extra courses in things like management and psychology. I think they were padding it out, to be quite honest with you. But I had a lot of different skills from, from doing the library course too. But of course, did very a lot of theory. Um, 
when I was a student, we literally sat at the desks and we had all the Dewey decimal classification schedules, all the UDC schedules out on the desk and you would flick through them to find um, what the correct classification should be. We got tested, we had to do exams on creating catalogue records using the actual catalogue cards, um, which now I know that COHA is a system that's used in library schools quite often for, for that kind of assessment, but I had the, the whole handwritten thing. So obviously things have moved on a huge amount um, in that time. But my dissertation when I was in my fourth year focused on expert systems and libraries. And unbeknownst to me, that kind of was, you know, where my career flourished from, because I then took an interest in sort of the technology side of libraries. And yeah, I, I sort of focused on that in my final year of uni, thought I had an interest for it, but still didn't necessarily think that of a career um, in the technology side. Whilst I was at uni, I continued working at the public library. They called on me for all the holiday cover and that was great. It kept, you know, get some income and it kept me sort of working within a, the library itself. So four years later and I qualified um, and, had, you know, had my library qualification. And the first job I had in a qualified post was for a pharmaceutical company called Merck Sharp, Sharp and Dome, and they're based in Harlow in Essex. Now, when I got that position, it was for 12 months fixed, um, and it was for a research information management assistant. And my role was very much split between the library and the research information teams. So within the library, it was very sort of very general library duties, dealt with the inquiries, I managed the circulation, I managed all the serial uh, management and interlibrary loans. And then in the research information department, I was you know, responsible for a lot of the, the records management and working with the scientists on, on assigning sort, sort of chemical numbers to them when, when they'd, um, you know, they'd created a new potion and whatnot. Now, one of the great things with getting that particular position at that time was I was fresh out of university and they were 100% committed to enhance my um, development. And they immediately said that they would put me through my chartership. So that was fantastic. Within a year of qualifying, I had got my chartership and you, you know, I'm pleased to say I'm, I've still got that, still got my, my SILIP um, membership and that's great. Whilst I was at MSD, the librarian that was there at the time um, went off on maternity leave. So I then got a temporary promotion to cover her post. But I still still kept a hand in with the research information side of things, but I did get that temporary librarian post and it ended up that I was at MSD for longer as well. Now, whilst I was doing that particular post, the, the library, the Merck Inc, I am to, to put it, give it its global name, they are a, you know, an international company um, and they were implementing a new library management system. And part of my role was really to, to work with the head of the team there to implement the LMS and that was Horizon at the time. And I was, involved with lots of testing, lots of feedback. And yeah, that gave me a completely different look into where I could go. And I could see that my dissertation actually played a role there. And all of a sudden, things were starting to move and I was starting to think about different areas within the library profession. So moving on after that, I got a job at Circe Limited, as they were called at the time now Circe Dynex. Um, at the time they were based in Potters Bar in Hertfordshire and they looked after the Unicorn Library Management System and my role there was as a customer services consultant and then laterally as a senior customer services consultant and what I did within that company was I worked on the help desk so I dealt with sort of everyday support queries that came in from our customer base. I really did an awful lot of project implementation. So I worked with the libraries 
the, the librarians, the library um, assistants and of all different levels to um, implement Unicorn within their library. I was able to configure the system following a workshop and during those workshops, we really discussed how the system would work for them in their library environment. And using my skills and experience of working within libraries and sort of having the theory behind what, what libraries are all about and knowing things like classification schemes and cataloging um, standards and so on, I was able to really advise them on how to get the most out of their system. And that was followed up with, with training as, as well. So two and a half years, I lived in Potters Bar 4, and then I moved home. So I moved back to Fife, and I started working remotely for the company following a, a very small break in service. And that was in 2003 that I started working remotely. And here we are almost 20 years later, and I've never gone back to work in an office. I have had a remote position ever since. Um, however, Following a reorganisation of the company and um, following my own maternity leave, my position changed um, and I became a senior support consultant. And the difference mainly was that the, the company divided the support and the customer services up into two. So I was no longer doing the project implementations. I was pretty much support based. But to be honest, at the time that suited because I had gone back after maternity leave on a part time basis. I had a baby and I couldn't really go out and do all the, the travel that the job entailed beforehand. So that continued for another couple of years. And then the company reorganized again and all the support positions got moved across to America. And unfortunately, my position was made redundant after 10 years. Um, but I was due to have another baby at that point. So the, the timing of that meant I had some time to, to, to look around whilst nursing a brand new baby and a two year old to, to try and find another post. Which brings me on to where we are just now. So Ailish has introduced PTFS Europe to you. Um, so as she has already said, we are completely virtual. So I am still working from home. I'm still based in Fife. And I started working for the company um, from two, in August 2011. My first role at the company was a customer services consultant. And just like what I've done at Circe, um, I really played a you know a huge role in, in implementing the Koha library management system into the libraries. So I, I did a lot of the project implementations. And as Ailish mentioned, we have got libraries of all you know shapes and sizes across all different sectors. So I was working with some very small specialist libraries to larger FE colleges and implementing it there to really ginormous uh, public library authorities as well so from all different scopes and as I'm sure you can imagine you know the needs of libraries using an LMS well they're all got the same needs but they're also very different as well so you have to you know the experience comes with sort of knowing the requirements within each of those sectors and also part of my role was to help the sales team out with demos and putting together some tender responses for them and so on. And then I had a little period where my role changed slightly, basically was more or less doing exactly the same role, but just in, under a training manager guys. And then more latterly, just before the current position that I'm in, I was customer relationship manager for the company. Um, and I continue to do all of everything I've just spoken about, but I also had far more involvement with the entire customer base. So I personally was responsible for building the relationships with the, with the customers, talking to them on a regular basis, just making sure they were happy with the systems that we helped them um, with, making sure they were happy with us as a company, because customer retention obviously is is key to any new business you know that we can get in is, is is brilliant but we've got to retain what we do have so we've just got to make sure you've got that good relationship with them and obviously you've got the opportunity then to to use your skills to try and do some cross-selling as well you know when they're talking to you about you know oh we're you know maybe I'm talking to a college and they're oh we're thinking of you know buying a lap safe locker to do our 
you know, to store our laptops. And then I'm able to talk to them about that and potentially get some additional um, sales in for us as well. And now that moves me on to the role that I'm doing just now, which is Head of Sales and Account Management. So I've been doing the show since December 2020. We are a very, very small team. Um, we've only got 18 members of staff in total within the company. So the sales team is only a very small proportion of that. Um, so I've got overall responsibility for the team. I also have the sector lead for the FE sector, so for our colleges, but in addition, the public libraries and the special libraries as well. My colleagues have, um, Andrew Eilish mentioned Andrew earlier, he's got responsibility for the HE sector and the health sectors, Jonathan for sort of the government and legal, and Eilish um, is taking over the special libraries really, um, as she's now been in post for a little while. So my job has changed again. All the skills and experience that I had are utilised within this show 100%. I can't really contribute to writing tender responses unless I know what I'm talking about. I need to have that library experience and knowledge to understand the requirements and to be able to translate into a language that they will understand that I know reads well with our systems as well. I do a lot of product demonstrations. And again, who are we presenting these to? Who, who are we giving a demonstration of Koha to? It's the libraries. So we need to know how libraries operate to be able to do that effectively. Um, as part of the sales team, Elish and myself, we represent the company um, at different sales events. So for example, Silip showcases. I'm always attending the, the Silip in Scotland um, annual conferences and autumn gatherings. So if any of you are there any time, do feel free to say hello to me. I'm always there. I'm there as a delegate. Um, I'm just in the audience, but yeah, I'm, I'm always at them. Um, represent the sales team within the company. We run, as Ailish said, lots of events, so always got you know a role to play within there. We create videos, sort of helpful hints and tips for our customers. And you, you know, I again I use my library skills and my knowledge of the system to be able to help contribute to them. My particular role is part of the management team. So I'm involved with, with sort of the wider management of, of the company. And of course, I work with Eilish, very closely with Eilish. Um, she's a member of my team and we are just, yeah, as I say, a very small team. So, so we work very well together. And I still sort of do other bits as well. Still sort of work with customer services and the technical team and the development team as and when needed. So what have I learned? Well, we need to know in our, in our roles, just because we're not within a library itself, we work with libraries day in, day out. Our future is working with libraries. So we need to know what librarians want and what they need. Need to have an understanding of the library environment and culture. And we need to be able to speak with the library staff using their language for them to have confidence in us and with, in us as a company. So I do think that, you know, if the, the people that we're working with, the libraries, they know that they're actually, yes, they're working with a support company, but they're working with librarians in that support company, then that gives an overall sense of confidence. And I do think that speaks volumes as well in sense of like a customer retention as well, because they know that they're not just working with a technical team, they're working with you know, a, a library support company who actually has librarians in there that understand the needs and wants of the libraries. So as a result, we can advise and discuss workflows to accommodate the systems, etc. So in summary, library degrees and qualifications, 100% fantastic, but they can be used in so many different ways, and not just in a library. And I I just hope that sort of hearing about my career and my ex experience and the different types of roles I've had lets you see that there is there is potential for you to sort of divert out into sort of more of a technical role. Your library skills will really, really help you with that. 
And I think I'm passing back to Eilish now. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, that really speaks to a lot of um, uh, what I've sort of um, seen as well, having been like, I started in August working with the company, but I think it's really worth highlighting that um, the people that work from PTFS are very much coming from a library background. So I know certainly whenever um, people ask what I do now, they think that I come from a computers and software background and it's really not the case. Um, but it is um, so valuable to come from the library world into um, working for an organization like PTFS. So I certainly think like, I'm glad that I um, came across this job and felt like um, I could cast the net a wee bit, bit wider and branch out a bit. Um, so um, I've just got a wee presentation prepared now that's very generally kind of anticipating a little bit about uh, future library skills, but I'm going to just go quite broad here. Let's see. Here we go. The user saying maybe the we presenter view one second. Yeah, we're seeing two panels here. That's what we saw. Let's see. No. That's better. That's that's nice. Mm -hmm. Second, I've just got about a million windows open and I'm getting rid of my old notes to find the new ones. Here we are now. All right, so as I was saying, I am just going to take a very kind of a broad view now and talk very generally on the subject of kind of future library skills. Um, so we've already seen a real kind of growing complexity within the library sector, and it's now very well established that desirable future skills are largely related to operating and navigating online. It's really like a moot point at this stage to say that developments over the past two years since the beginning of COVID have underlined the centrality of like networking and connectedness and social information in our everyday lives. Uh, I came across um, a study um, from about 10 years ago from a guy called Rainey and Wellman. Uh, they described our change in information behavior as network individualism which I think is a really prescient term if you think about the way things are moving now um, with so much talk about the metaverse and things uh, the past few months especially. We've really developed all these new ways of managing our information use in the context of social media and these are part of networks that aren't limited by physical space and it's so kind of unprecedented and the changes have been so rapid and all-consuming. Um, that it's really quite hard to kind of predict where things are going if you kind of look at the rate of change over the past 50 years. But we see now that the changes that have occurred um, have, have created these digital networks that are flexible, adaptive, and they're global. And really now they constitute the basis for today's society. Um, and for library professionals, you know, it presents scope for new opportunities to create much needed efficiencies for this kind of complex information management. And many of these opportunities exist outside the traditional roles that we might think of. But that being said, I think that the professional identity um, is firmly anchored in traditional core values and competencies of librarianship. And I think that they'll really remain essential in spite of these kind of broader contextual changes that we'll look into a wee bit. So how it looks for here. 
So recently, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics predicted that there would be a 9% growth in the library job market in the coming decade. And this doesn't even include expanding fields in the information profession, like um, titles such as digital asset managers or corporate archivists, to name but a few. Uh, it's notable that what often gets missed are like private sector roles. Um, but even in the past 10 years, we've seen that the required skill set has changed dramatically. Um, already, I'm sure, um, as kids, new professionals or students, you've seen maybe uh, posts for titles like digital curators, maybe, or maybe social media managers and other kinds of content specialists that all come under that umbrella of kind of list professions. Um, digital content has become so central to the role of librarians. And I think part of the reason why that's been very helpful for me is having that little bit of kind of social media experience during my graduate traineeship at the University of Bradford um, has been helpful for me working in this role today uh, with the marketing component for PTFS Europe. Uh, I manage all our kind of social media and Twitter accounts and as well for Silip Scotland. And um, so it just goes to show it's another string that I think you're very much expected to have on your bow. Um, but as well as that, there are specific roles dedicated increasingly. So as part of this report um, that was released by Pearson in conjunction with Oxford University, um, they're looking at over the next kind of 10 years, these seven mega trends. Uh, so they think that change will be driven, of course, by new technology, and that's really encompassing the rise of automation um, for the most part. Um, and it also encompasses globalization, demographic change, environmental sustainability, urbanization, rising inequality, and political uncertainty. So these are seen to be the kind of like seven factors that are going to have the biggest kind of impact on our working lives in the next decade. So as libraries are fundamentally concerned with people and society, I think it's fairly obvious to any list worker that these concepts will shape the nature of our working lives. They're worth anticipating when we consider what kind of future skills we need to cultivate in response to both the change in job market and the change in work environment. But first of all, to kind of get back to basics, um, the core values of librarianship um, so these are three of the most kind of consistent tenants we can draw on maybe if we want to really break it down into three essentials, inclusiveness, diversity and intellectual freedom are kind of three stalwarts here. Maybe a decade or two, you could take these core values for granted, but in more recent years, we've seen how we need to be more proactive about enacting these core values like we're living in very kind of fractious times. But in the library sector, at least, we have seen really good proactivity, things like um, big moves in decolonizing library connections, as well as diverse, diversifying the profession. Uh, for example, maybe I haven't come across them um, just yet, but I remember uh, when I was living in Bradford up north, um, there was a lot of noise being made by Dylan, which is an organization that is committed to diversifying the profession. And um, so it, it has a really positive impact because it reflects kind of societal changes at large. And that's what we really want to be doing is keeping pace with change as a means of future proofing the profession. But then also on an individual level, kind of our ways of thinking, this kind of action shows that we can apply our skills and turn values into action the better the sector as a whole. But in saying that, Enacting these kind of skills um, relies on management and leadership skills. So um, increasingly, if you kind of look at various uh, library and information courses um, across the UK, there is more of a marked emphasis on management and leadership skills. Um, I'm actually in the third year of my library and information management degree with the University of Ulster. And um, so I'm just writing up my dissertation at the moment, um, but I know that last year um, we dedicated an entire semester to 
concepts around leadership, leadership styles, and submitted a portfolio of work on that topic. Uh, I think it's really key to look for a course that strikes the right balance of technical skills along with communication and management skills because um, there's an emphasis on management and leadership in these courses because there is a real call out from um, the sector to enhance leadership skills um, and really that starts at the education level. So this could encompass things like budgeting, marketing, community outreach, leadership and instructional skills. Um, and the key thing here is if we're thinking about skills for the future, what kind of jobs will be out here there in, um, sorry, in 10 years time? All these skills have such a wider application and thereby enhance the reach and relevance of library and information services, but also on a personal level, level enhances your own skill set and employability. Um, following on for that, similarly, there's ever more emphasis on interpersonal skills. This is in part connected to the mega trend um, that I was alluding to before about the increased automation and AI that we're anticipating now to having a big impact on our working lives increasingly. Um, the specific skills incorporate teaching, social perceptiveness, service orientation and persuasion. And you know, it ties in further to the other noted mega trends like demographic change and increased inequality. So what we're getting from this is the idea that libraries and library professionals um, will increasingly be in demand for providing more of a kind of um, a human touch and providing that kind of infrastructure that provides more kind of social support, um, which is something a robot could never learn to do, you'd hope. Um, as well as that then, what we get from the report is they also confirm the importance of what they refer to as higher order cognitive skills, which they kind of list as complex problem solving, originality, fluency of ideas and active learning. And they sound a bit kind of highfalutin here. I think it sounds a bit overcomplicated. That largely speaks to, I think, how we can't fully anticipate the changes that we'll see to the sector in our lifetime. We're just sort of at the incipient stages of discussions around the metaverse and things like that and really virtual spaces online i don't think in the 60s like librarians could have ever like conceptualized contemporary practices around managing your library's social media accounts for example so cultivating general skills in this area which i think really could be synonyms for being adaptable being an agile thinker and being a lifelong learner will see you well in a sector that's going to continue to see an awful lot of change in the coming years So in addition to work in traditional library settings, um, the expertise of librarians is increasingly employed in the private sector um, and jobs for librarians outside traditional roles are expected to grow fastest in the next 10 years as the expanding amount of information available continues to require professionals who can find, sort and process it effectively. Uh, so really I think that kind of expertise is gonna become increasingly valued um, as it is, I think the online world is getting increasingly difficult to navigate. Um, if you look at kind of internet culture more broadly, you know, I think we hear a lot about various literacy, literacies and things, and um, whether that's information literacy, which has sort of been then tacked on to digital literacy. And one that I'm seeing more and more is internet literacy. And um, it's kind of talked about how to sort of navigate the online world in a way that's safe, that keeps you protected as it kind of bleeds more and more over into kind of real world consequences. And like, I think, for example, about kind of all the recent stuff about NFTs and the sort of like board ape yacht club things where people are just spend a hideous amount of money uh, on these NFTs and these images that are just immediately getting stolen because they're falling victim to various scams or they're not learned enough about their rights and what the kind of copyright implications are of owning something like that. 
Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see how libraries react and in what ways they can kind of step up to make sure that um, these concepts are just more kind of, um, just that people have a better kind of foreground in, in what their kind of rights are and somewhere to turn to really for this kind of information. Um, so they're expected to grow the fastest in the next 10 years in the private sector. Um, as a result, um, librarians are already increasingly working for private corporations, nonprofits, and consultant firms. And um, there's also a trend increasingly um, where there's more independent information professionals um, referring to themselves as information brokers who are having some success setting up businesses to research and manage information for private clients. Because again, I think it's just become really unwieldy, that level of expertise. Um, has really become um, valued as there's just such an information overload really as soon as you log in to any kind of computer interface. So um, just as well to note kind of two key things that I thought were worth considering in this um, area then if we're talking about sort of future skills developing and managing virtual spaces. So there's often a distinction between the skills needed in a traditional library setting versus a digital context. Um, but I'd say this is increasingly becoming irrelevant, both because the line between the virtual and the real and how we work um, is becoming increasingly blurred. Um, and also um, the idea of traditional library settings or indeed roles has become a bit redundant as well. Um, traditional library skills, would maybe think about collecting and organizing information if you were to kind of put it into one phrase or sentence. Um, but this is going to become increasingly important online in an online context. For example, thinking about digital repositories, VLEs, or more informal networks like wikis and forums are already kind of maybe online spaces which need that kind of um, structure and organization in some senses. Um, information is no longer just limited to being library property and there's a need for the understanding of how people seek and use information as well as the need for the creation of well-managed spaces online. And the library can really become a leader in this area as the conversation grows. I think we've seen a lot in recent years of online spaces growing really toxic and difficult because they're not well managed and um, information becoming kind of um, used in all these different ways and information and fake information just becoming dirty words. And I think it is really key that the library steps up and becomes leader um, especially when we've seen in recent years, for example, um, sort of social media, especially becoming a bit of an information wild west, people becoming kind of radicalized and, you know, reports of people kind of voting certain ways because of how their timeline looks. I think it really is um, some, you know, in need of a massive overhaul in certain areas. And um, I think library and information professionals could really be at the forefront of that. So thinking then about the actual real world application, titles associated with this sort of overall skill that we're seeing more of developing and managing virtual spaces. So you've maybe already seen advertisements. I think I've come across this title quite a bit of knowledge management specialists. These are people who capture knowledge, um, including that which usually resides just in the heads of people, organize it in a way that makes it readily usable and shareable. Um, also information architects who design the conceptual structure and logical organization of websites, intranets, and online communities. So again, these are people who are already kind of one step in the list world, but if you're interested in expanding your horizons, they're worth looking into because it is very much connected to concepts that are important for the sector's future. So following on from that as well, we're seeing increasingly there's a remit for list professionals to support information networks. Um, I think whenever I think of that term information network, 
initially what comes to mind are academic libraries. We've seen a lot of changes to scholarly communication already in the past um, 10, 20 years, and this has definitely been accelerated by the move to online learning. And so things like open access, altmetrics, data sharing, text and data mining, and using social media to disseminate and actually get your research funded are areas that are developed currently. But there's also a lot of scope for private sector work in the titles that I've listed below, as again, information networks are becoming so much more complex and require a greater, greater level of expertise to interact with. So information brokers, for example, can provide a variety of research for like clients. Um, specialties in that area currently include market research and patent searches. But this could really be expanded to any type of information research. So it'll be exciting to see um, how that specific profession develops going forward and also competitive knowledge analysis and research. So these are kind of increasingly competitive roles for people who can acquire and structure information for organizations in a similar way to your information broker. Um, but both these roles are a result of our information systems becoming more complex and difficult to navigate. So again, just generally, as I was saying, I think there is so much scope and so much opportunity for list professionals in the future. And I think kind of there's a lot of kind of reason to have hope for a level of newfound kind of um, respect for the profession and for the sector. Um, I think, you know, there has always been a lot of fear mongering around increasing sort of digitalization and movement to online. But really, I think it's an exciting time and it's an exciting time to sort of keep pace with this change um, within the sector. So thanks very much. Um, I'll stop now just so we can have a few minutes for questions to either Fiona or myself um, on anything we've discussed this evening. But thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Ailish and Fiona. That was great. Um, that was very inspiring, actually, the end, um, to know which kind of skills um, will be needed in the future. And definitely some aspects that I hadn't really connected with uh, librarianship, such as NFTs, because um, they are still quite new to all of us. But it's very, very helpful and very inspiring. I hope that um, other people have felt the same. Um, Yes, Marta is saying that um, it's very interesting and informative. Um, so are there any questions to be put in the chat? Um, personally, I had one. I was wondering how much did your degree play into um, getting into the specific field that you're in? Um, so for instance, if you're a fully trained library assistant, would you be able to do the job that you are currently doing? Um, yeah, I think experience, it absolutely is key as well. Um, I mean, the, for, to do my particular role, I think is the qualification is, is an add-on, but experience is, is more relevant, definitely. Um, certainly when I got my very first job, they were looking for a qualification but it wasn't mandatory um but going forward yeah i think experience in libraries is is probably a bit more important than than the qualification and you, you quite often i i find that in job specifications it says you know qualification is desirable but not essential and you know if you've got as a library assistant you've met the criteria for what that the role is then go for it definitely I think just to um, add to that a wee bit, um, I was, uh, I remember whenever I applied for my role in the summer, um, as I was saying, I'm in the last year of my degree, and I was very much seeing it as a professional post and thinking, oh, am I sort of, you know, unofficially ineligible, ineligible because I don't have my master's yet. But um, I find um, because I had a committee role, on Silip Ireland, um, bit of a plug there for the vacant committee roles in <laughs> Philip's SNPC. Um, I was able to really add a lot to my CV that was very relevant to a role in sales and marketing. So I really think it's so valuable to have um, 
outside experience wherever you can to sort of um, help you make a bit of a leap between like library assistants to professional posts, whatever that may be. Okay, well, thank you very much for um, plugging the role again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions um, from anyone else, uh, I will stop the recording now and say thank you again for a brilliant talk tonight. Um, incredibly helpful. And um, yeah, we'll post the recording at some point soon. Um, so people will be able to access us who were not able to be here tonight. And thank you very much for coming and for speaking. No, thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you. All right.